Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated and this is Claymores of the Lost Kingdom, an innovative roguelike deck builder which is going to be launched in the next couple of days on the 25th of November. And the devs who were kind enough to send on a copy for me to check out, describe this as Slay the Spire meets open world RPG adventuring. So the first thing we do is we build our character. We have a number of races to pick from and descriptions of how easy or difficult the initial challenge will be. We can also set their background. We'll go for Peddler for our Dwarf. We can change the name and we can decide on an appropriate portrait. But the one thing you will see is that we can't pick our starting class. And that's because as we play the game, we're actually going to create our own unique class. As we start, we're given a description based on what race and background we took, and a starting option. We lose some HP, but gain some starting defense. I think we'll take that option. And here is an initial choice of cards that we want to take. And we can hover over them to get a description of what they do. This one has a trigger tactic, so when we cause blunt damage to the enemy, then we punish 3, which reduces the maximum HP of the enemy. I'm going to take this one instead. On block, we will deal 2 physical damage. 0 in the top is the mana cost for playing the cards. And this is where we start. We begin... In the world of Ruthia, now as a dwarf, we're always going to start on the very west of the map, and I think we're actually outside the borders of Ruthia itself, which is off in this direction. And we're told that we have 201 turns until Doomsday. We don't have a map, and we can't really see much beyond where we start. I do know that what I think is effectively the dwarven capital is up in this direction. And what we can do is we can move to either of these spaces. It's going to consume the one and only ration that we have. So we'll wander in this direction. And at the very beginning, there's basically a bit of an introduction. Here is Knut the Peddler. Hey, we're a peddler as well. And they're under attack from a bandit. Which brings us nicely into the first battle. Now, I should have actually shown what cards we have. The enemy is starved, so their maximum health is heavily reduced. The battles follow many of the same mechanics and patterns as you would expect from a deck builder. We have our health. The blue number represents our additional defense. This one represents how many mana points we have. And we have a maximum, but I'm not too sure what it actually is. It's basically, if this was filled up to the top, our starting mana and our mana maximum can be increased as we level up. And we have active tactics, so brew, fueled, grit, preemptive, passive, on grudge, below 50%, plus one defense. So basically, if we fall below 50% HP, we will gain an additional one defense. Now hovering over this card, we can again see down the right hand side that we have lots and lots of descriptions of what it actually does. It's a tactic card, which means that it exists for a period of time. It's going to basically go up into the top left hand corner for four turns. There's ways of actually getting it to stay there for longer, at the end of which then it'll be destroyed. So it won't go back into our discard pile or our deck to uh, come out again in future. So do you know what? We as might as well as we can, we will play it. And on playing this one, I will take 3x2 damage. Because our turn is over, he attacks. We have no remaining cards. If I had, I would be given the option to discard them. So here you can see this one costs 2 mana. Not going to be able to play that. So here's the one that we picked up at the start. Because I couldn't play this card, my turn ended. We now have a discard phase. I can either pass to keep this in my hand, or discard to get an additional mana at the start of the next turn. So you gain one mana at the start of each turn. That does not change. So it looks like our mana max is four. Now at the moment we might as well just wail on this guy as much as we can. So deal five blunt and 
deal two physical. So there's different types of attack damage, same as, uh, similar to D&D, we've actually gotten an achievement for killing an enemy on their own turn, so they dealt damage to us, which was reflected back at them. That managed to kill them. We gain 97 XP, which we will claim. And at the end of that, we have gained some equipment. Diplomat's pants. Are you telling me we've been going around here with no pants? So I can click on that to take them. They are automatically equipped. We've leveled up. And this is one of the unique and innovative parts of the game. Like I said, we effectively build our own class. Now I'm going to be given an option right after I make this choice as to uh, one of three cards to pick from to add to the deck. And the probability of being shown, we'll say intelligence cards, is dependent on how many points we have in intelligence at the moment. My understanding is we effectively don't have any. So I'm not going to be able to get cards which depend on intelligence. At the moment, it's most likely that I'm going to get constitution and dexterity cards. Uh, we can also see that we get benefits for each level up. So again, we craft our own class as we go on. Considering the type of character that I have at the moment, probably wouldn't be a great idea to put too many points into wisdom or intelligence. Uh, we can increase our HP, our HP and weight limit, so that's trade goods and equipment, or maybe just trade goods, or plus one to our starting mana points. Do you know what? We're going to go for that one. Now my hand size has also increased, which means that I'll be able to hold three cards instead of two, as happened in that combat. And we can see now that the cards that I've been shown, here's a dex card, here's a con card. Uh, this one because I have a dexterity of 10, this one because I have a constitution of 10, and this one because I have 10 in both dexterity and constitution. So this is a card that is unique to having a certain level of dexterity and a certain level of constitution. And there are cards for all of the combos. So there's a strength intelligence card in there somewhere. For now though, I like the look of this shield slam. So deal five physical damage, expend five defense to deal four blood. So that gets added into our deck. We've gained rations. We also have a bag with one head in it. The head of the bandit that we just killed. They're worth five rations in a guild outpost. There might be one here. Up here in the top left hand corner, we can take a look at our stats. We can take a look at our equipment. All we're doing at the moment is wearing a pair of pants. Here is our deck as it is at the moment. So you can see it is quite small. But nobody should feel bad for having a small deck. It's the way you use it. It's the way you use it. It's powerful. Small, but powerful. Trust me. Uh, here again is our attributes. If we had any trade goods. And... Question mark. So we'll move north to Dale Watch Tower. And this gives us the option to explore because it's an actual explorable location so it has a trade house it has a rest it could have a tavern but in this case it doesn't it could have a guild outpost but in this case it doesn't there's potentially a random traveler in the area or just a, a random option so we've met an old veteran and we could unlearn a card if we wanted to at the moment i'll say never mind for the trade house, we don't really have, we actually can't buy anything other than salt for four rations. We don't have a lot of rations at the moment. The region that we're in, I believe, sells tools quite cheaply. So we could buy tools in this direction and then sell them on another part of the map. We could sell pelts here for plus two over the base price fabric for plus one over the base price so you can see we could sell tools for minus one under the base price so we'd actually be losing on average we'd be losing rations if we were to try and sell tools here and there's also mithril dust and mithril i think this is some form of illicit narcotic that we might be able to buy and there's certain places it can be traded 
or we can give it to certain NPCs that we might meet on the road. For now, we'll continue on, and as we move from location to location, our rations decrease. I think I'm going to continue moving eastward, hoping that we'll come across some bandits, because we are losing rations fairly quickly. Here's Knut again, so we're going to see a lot of him in the very early stages as he guides us towards the, the kind of the story of the game. So you could just wander around and kill bandits, and we can actually see there's one. We can just about see the devil over here in the corner, but there is a story, and you're going to be directed to take certain quests as the countdown in the top right-hand corner keeps hidden towards zero. So Knut is introducing us to Captain Ari, a member of the guard, who is basically going to give us food for head. So there you go. By clicking on the guild, we've been given five rations. Thanks. Let's let's never speak of this again. The other really interesting thing that we can see here is that Sergeant Gunther, who's just an NPC, uh, we might see him if we click on this hand, or it might be a completely different character, but they're basically commenting on the fact that we are a dwarf, and there are some severe racial tensions in this region. If, as an elf, you go in the opposite direction, you go and visit the region that I just left, you will be made feel very unwelcome, and dwarves generally are treated quite poorly in this part of the world. Now, it's not Sergeant Gunther, but it's a shady merchant. I'm not going to be able to afford any of the stuff he's selling, but there's, for 95 rations, a rusty helmet, which will give us increased armor, a tradesman's trousers for increased haggling, so when we're given certain missions, certain escort tasks to, we'll say, escort somebody from one village to another, there's a set price but your haggling can then actually result in you getting a bit more, so 5% more rations. And rations can be used to both survive and buy more equipment. So just to the north of the region that we left, we meet another starved bandit. So there's a couple of different types that you're going to meet. This guy has a very, very low HP, but has plus 20 defense. And his intent is basically to buff his magical damage. He's going to do that maybe twice and then start dealing, I think, around 7 damage. So we either need to take him out quickly or add some defense. We're starting with plus 5 and unlike in other uh, deck builders, we'll say like Slay the Spire, our block isn't going to disappear at the end of our turn. And also we can see that we're now starting with 2 mana because of the advancement that we took uh, when we leveled up. So we might as well throw out our Ironbeard Endurance. Here's the new card that we picked up, Deal 5 Physical. And we can actually use up our defense to then deal additional damage. So he's taken 2 actual damage and he's lost 9 from his defense. So that's done a significant chunk of damage to him. And now if he actually hits us, he's going to take damage. So he's buffing himself again. On our next turn, we will deal 5 slashing damage. So there's a lot of cards like this which will deal effects on your next turn. Now as much as I would love to hound this old man to oblivion, unfortunately I'm not going to have the mana to do so at the start of the next turn. Actually, by not pounding as hard, I will have the mana to do so. So he's going to hit me for seven. He's knocked off one hit point. I will discard that. And we'll give him, do you know what? We'll pound him harder. We gained about 102 XP there, and it's 101 to the next level up. So in the early stages, we're going to be leveling up very quickly. I'm not pushed about haggling at the moment. So our options are between max HP or max HP and weight limit. However, by 
upgrading our strength, it brings us closer to getting plus one starting defense on the next level up. And again, our cards, we actually do get a wisdom nine, but we have a dex strength and a strength con. Now it is hard to say no to a card that is zero cost. And so we can see that as the game goes on, as we level up, we basically craft our class around where we want to go with our character. We can put the attributes, dump them all into strength and make them really powerful straight off the bat, uh, level them across multiple stats. We have all of the base D&D &D stats except for charisma. And we also get to add cards to our deck every time we level up and in a few other unique situations. And this again allows us to build our character and build our class as we continue on our adventure. And our later decisions are going to be very much reflective and dependent on the decisions that we make early on in the game. Now I've just moved a small bit to the north and arrived at the monastery. <coughs> the Iron Ridge Monastery. Sorry. The Iron Ridge Monastery. Shh, be quiet. Uh, we can see that our renown isn't great, and as we assist the people in various different regions, there's a number of factions that we can gain the support or the opposition of. And we have the Militia Outpost, so there you go, food for head. We can go to the Trade House. It's a bit expensive to buy leather. It's plus one over the normal base price, but we could get some fabric for 14 rations, don't have it, but fabric here is cheap, and it would be a good place to sell mithril and pelts. We have the ability to rest, and thankfully we can camp outside, it's one ration. I did play as an elf, so I've done a full run of this already as an elf, and resting outside was zero. Now I'm not sure is this just because of the monastery or if it's because I'm a dwarf and they don't like dwarves. To gain back that six, do you know what? We'll do it. <laughs> On the next morning we're told some local rumors. Sometimes they're nothing and sometimes they do actually give you Knowledge that can lead you in the direction of some happenings as part of the major story. And finally, somebody's arrived, an old veteran. There are convoys, uh, characters moving around the map. They can get ambushed by bandits and you can go and help them. And sometimes they will arrive in the same uh, major settlement that you're in. You can't, you can talk to them. But uh, there's nothing really, no major interaction with them. However, there is a quest, a side quest, is available. So Iron Ridge Monastery Monk requested that I escort a tax collector to Sunken Mine Garrison in one piece. And as somebody pointed out when I was streaming this on Twitch, for some reason, all of these escort missions, they want you to do them while wearing a one piece. It's very well observed by somebody in the Twitch chat. So they'll give us 41 rations, and that's then going to be affected by our haggling stat. We will confirm. And again, we don't have a map. There's no map that we can actually look at. All we can really do is that's about it. That's the extent that we can see on the map. So you pretty much need to, from repeat playthroughs, get an idea of where everything is. I know that... Helm Gorge, not Helm's Deep, Helm Gorge, is somewhere to the north. I've no idea the actual route to get there though. But we do have an arrow that's pointing us in the general direction of the Sunken Mine Garrison. Now unfortunately, and this is quite common in airdy playthroughs, we are down to zero rations. So as I take another trip forward, I take one HP of damage. We do see, however, a low life. So this is the first low life, the first bandit that we're fighting that isn't just starved. They also have towering presence, so their successful physical attacks will increase their defense and their armor. Uh, so they have increased armor, so our physical attacks against them are going to do less damage. 
But thankfully we're able to whittle away at their HP. We're able to spatter them with some blood. And then... Pound them into oblivion. I did say I was going to go for that starting defense. So we will increase our strength by one. And so now we're beginning to see quite a lot of strength cards coming out. So this one came out on the last selection as well. Mana plus three if panicking. So there are some statuses that can be applied to us and that we can apply to the enemy. Deal six physical. Mana plus one if panicking. It's only a cost of one. Though repelling fab. Oh wait, no, repelling jab. Uh, that will actually decrease the enemy's chance to hit us, so it'll decrease their accuracy. We'll take that. Now, it looks like we want to get into this city, but as can be seen, there's no actual direct route to get there. So, down to Lookout Hills. And there is an execution being carried out by criminals. So, we are going to come to his rescue and pound his executioners. And here we actually see the wounded guard is a companion. So they're dealing one physical damage to the enemy. So because as part of the story they're in the same tile, they're actually on our side and giving us a bit of assistance. And again, if you find a convoy being attacked by one of these bandits, the convoy that's being attacked can actually show up here and help. So again, we'll spatter them with some blood. We could hit them on the next turn, but they're going to hit me for four, so... I'll have to do this to hopefully get some defense. No. And you know what, I will discard that to get some mana together. And again, in he comes with the one. We can add one to bring us to seven, and then this will expand five. We might be lucky enough... No. We're not lucky enough that it will take them out, but they are stunned, so they don't actually manage to attack us, and we should be able to pound. Didn't pound hard enough. It's, uh, yeah. Something I've been told of recent. We didn't do our pounding warm-up, that's, that's obviously what happened. And for saving that camp guard, we discover that he is a veteran warrior, so we gain 100 XP for that. And we also had the XP from the battle. So we're into another level up. And you know, we'll take that dexterity to start pushing us towards the extra starting mana points. So our hand size has increased again. We're now up to uh, four cards in a hand. And we can see a specific dex card, which deals 3x2 slashing. I do like the look of this one, but it is 3 mana to play. So I think, do you know what? Yeah. Yeah, we'll take this one. It's 2 mana. It's going to deal 8 physical damage, and it's going to break the enemy armor. And there have been a couple of occasions where the enemy has put together a good chunk of defenses. So just outside the city, we're beginning to lose HP again because we've run out of rations. Here is the Half Sea District, which is known for two things. First, thieves and beggars living there. And secondly, it's rundown houses and rat infested buildings. If we go to the Trade House, however, it is one of the only, if not the only place where we can sell mithril dust. And it's also a part of the map where we can buy what is... Effectively, the cheapest trade good, nails. And this is the cheapest place where we can buy them. And I think they sell they sell for four in Helm's Gorge. I'm not too sure where else they're, they're valuable. I think we'll continue on into Hinterguard. So we get ten rations for the two heads that we hand in. It's enough to keep us going for a short while. Here we see some other caravans on the road, and there we get a bit of a, an interaction with them. They're headed to Hinterguard with bread. Safe travels. 
And as we continue on our escort mission, we actually see that there is a caravan being attacked at the Nowhere Gate. Now this guy is gas. Doom, you will die in eight turns. Fight, you will die in seven turns. Well, the best way of making sure that doesn't come to fruition is, first of all, we will do our pounding warm-up. We've learnt our lesson. We have Shield Slam, so we can expand five defense. What he's going to do is he's going to force us to discard two cards, so we might as well play as many of them as we can. And then, now that we have done our pounding warm-up, we will pound harder. And then pound him into oblivion. For assisting him, the caravan has given us one ration, so it might be an idea to actually follow a caravan, and as they keep meeting bandits, keep rescuing them and keep getting one ration from them every single time. We'll go for Dex again to get that starting MP. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not delighted with any of these, maybe the strength 11. The pierce on the right hand side, deal three piercing, draw one. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to skip and take the ten rations. Now we've made it as far as Red Ring, which is a very important location within the game. The magistrate is telling us that if we've brought a pickaxe, that we'll find no mithril to steal here. This is where the mages of the ring are based, so we could give them mitral dust to discover some new cards. We'll hand in the head of the bandit that we just killed. And unfortunately, it is quite pricey. Yeah, these devils would charge through the nose, I'd say. We'll have to pay the five rations. So legend has it that the first paladins of Ruthia were ordered to forever stand watch at the tomb of the last king, but now, centuries later... Nobody knows where his final rest actually is. Well, I think somebody knows. They're going to appear wielding it in 166 days. Now we can pay one ration for passage to Elven Landing. I'm trying to get down. I have a feeling in this direction. Do you know what? We'll confirm. And it's taken us across to there. So you can see that it's no longer pointing us in any direction because we are close to wherever it is that we need to go. It's somewhere adjoining us. I think we're going to have to go down in this direction. We make short work of the bandit. For the first time, we don't get a level up. And there we go. The tax collector has been escorted in a one piece. The reward is 41 rations, but I'll try to negotiate a little extra based on our haggling. And so we got 45. So those are the major mechanics of Claymores of the Forgotten Kingdoms. At the end of the 200 turns, we have 163 left at the end of that, what is going to happen is the Harbinger of Doom is going to emerge. And there are basically three ways to win the game. One is to survive. To do that, we need to get to Helm's Gorge on the 200th turn, and we will be basically escorted out of Ruthia as it falls to plagues of undead warriors bent on the destruction of every living being that they come across. So that's a type of victory. The second is to prevent the prophecy from coming into force. Now I imagine that means that we would have to locate the Claymore of the Lost Kingdoms before the Harbinger of Doom does. Because if we don't, then he will wield that sword on the final day, and we will have to fight him, and he is very tough. I've had great fun with this. I'll be playing more Claymores of the Lost Kingdom over on Twitch as it approaches its release on the 25th of November. If you'd like to check out more of the game or if you'd like to ask me anything about it, 
As always, thank you for joining me on this episode, and I hope to see you again in future, because, uh, I got a, I got a deal on some, some good high-quality mithril dust you might be interested in.